the ninth meeting in 2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off mobile phones as they do affect the broadcasting system. As meeting papers are provided in digital format, you may see tablets being used during the meeting. No apologies have been received. Uh, today's only agenda item is for the committee to take further evidence on its freight transport inquiry. The Freight Transport in Scotland inquiry. This week the committee will hear from two panels, the first featuring regional transport partnerships and Transform Scotland. The second panel will be with Network Rail. Can I welcome Michael Cairns, Strategy Manager at Tayside and Central Scotland Transport Partnership, Alec McCauley, South East Scotland Transport Partnership, Councillor James Stockin, Chair, and Neil McRae, Highlands and Islands Transport Partnership, and Phil Matthews, Chair of Transform Scotland. Uh, I think we'll move straight to questions. Um, can I kick off by asking you to provide the committee with an overview of your organisation and the role it plays in Scottish freight transport, please? And who would like to kick off? Thanks, Chair. Um, as as uh, the committee will well know, Sestran uh, is one of the seven regional transport partnerships in Scotland, the statutory uh, regional strategic transport planning bodies. Um, we cover an area from the Scottish borders up to the River Tay, uh, encompassing uh, eight local authorities and a population of about one and a half uh, million people. Um, the committee will also be aware that the fundamental role of regional transport partnerships is to produce and monitor and uh, assist with the implementation of a regional transport uh, strategy, uh, which we have done uh, within SESTRAN. Uh, we have just recently uh, completed a review of the first regional transport strategy, and that strategy itself includes a wide range uh, of policies and uh, proposals which are in support of uh, rail freight um, in the region and connectivity of the region uh, to elsewhere in Scotland uh, and beyond. A fundamental element of that uh, uh, set of policies and proposals is our firm belief that the estuary of the River Forth and its surrounding land areas uh, form uh, the strategic uh, logistics <coughs> gateway uh, for Scotland to mainland Europe and indeed uh, beyond that. And there are strong uh, policies in support of that. Um, in that context also, um, we uh, are very supportive of the policies within NPF3, uh, which identify uh, the need for improved waterborne freight in the fourth estuary, and indeed are very supportive of uh, Grangemouth as a logistics uh, centre and a, a development centre um, um, for uh, uh, central Scotland. Um, we have, over the years, been involved in a number of EU-funded um, uh, freight-based uh, projects, um, to name a few, one called Dryport, one called Foodport, one called Low Pinod, and one called uh, Weast Flows. Um, and indeed, we did uh, join with partners in Weast Flows um, under the former chairmanship of, of this committee and gave a presentation to a number of members of the committee uh, last year on the outputs uh, from uh, the Weast Flows project. Um, these projects have identified a number of areas where um, improvements to freight logistics could be beneficial to the Scottish e economy. For example, in the Dryport project, uh, we have uh, completed stag appraisals for uh, the Leavenmouth rail link for extension of passenger and freight services uh, down to Leavenmouth uh, for extension of the Stirling Alloa line uh, round to Rosyth with uh, the Charleston Cord and the importance of getting uh, rail freight and maintaining the rail freight sidings uh, into the Rosyth port. Um, we have reinforced the role of um, um, Coat Bridge, in fact, as Scotland's uh, main uh, dry port centre. Um, and we have also, as part of that project, produced a freight map and publications of rail freight services uh, to and from Scotland to assist uh, the industry in uh, 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 choosing the, the potential for rail rather than uh, depending purely on road. Um, within the Foodport project, we did an analysis of food 
uh, uh, products in and out uh, of Scotland and were very uh, uh, active in lobbying for uh, the support for the Recife to Zeebrugge uh, freight service. And I'm glad to say with Scottish Government support that seems now to be uh, more secure, certainly, than it was uh, 12 months ago. Within the Lopinod project, we've carried out studies of the empty containers in Scotland. As, as a, the committee will know, Scotland is a net exporter, unlike the rest of the UK, the net result of which is we have to pay in Scotland <coughs> for the import uh, of, of empty containers in order to service the export industry. And, and we also uh, uh, commissioned a, a bulk freight study of the ports uh, around Scotland as well. Within waste flows, it flagged up one of the major deficiencies which in the Joint Chair's submission we identified, which is a, a shortage of uh, robust information on freight flows. And that applies not just in Scotland, it applies actually throughout Europe. And as part of the waste flows project, we, we produced a set of trip matrices for the four main uh, modes uh, of freight movement on a zone-by-zone -zone basis, something like 70-odd zones in Northwest Europe. And I think that's, in fact, the first time that that's actually been uh, achieved. I think we can come on to some of these specifics in the course of our, yep. our uh, session. Um, who else would like to provide an overview of their organisation and the contribution it makes to the freight transport sector? Uh, in terms of uh very much picking up on what uh, Alec has already said, uh, with the regional transport partnership that covers Sangus, Dundee, Perthingmoss and Stirling, uh, with about half a million population. And we sit astride the main routes connecting the central belt with the West Highlands, Inverness in the north, and Aberdeen, so in quite a strategic location. Um, in terms of our involvement with freight, uh, along with three of our TPs, uh, we have a freight quality partnership, which meets at roughly six monthly intervals. Uh, attendees on a regular basis at that are the Freight Transport Association, the Road Haulage Association, uh, the region's ports and our local authority partners. Um, through the um, FQP we've done quite a bit of work in terms of looking at the road haulage sector, overnight lorry parking, lorry route maps, uh, providing a website for road freight information. Um, we're also involved with the Regional Timber Transport Group, uh, which is concerned with the movement of timber from felling to uh, end user. And uh, it's a major issue within the region as a significant areas of forestry, many of which are coming up to a point of being felled at the moment. Uh, we've had some involvement with the rail freight industry. Um, it's a bit of a whole in the rail freight sector generally. A lot of rail freight passes through the region, but there are no terminals within the region currently. Uh, but we have done work in looking at trying to develop facilities for timber, seed potatoes and bottled water within the region. And we do have some hopes for the next few months in terms of at least two of those. Uh, similarly, we've been involved with European projects. Uh, the two we've been involved in have concerned uh, the last mile or city logistics. Um, one was the enclosed project where we worked jointly with uh, Dundee City Council, the result of which was the production of a sustainable urban logistics plan, which sets out the way forward in terms of promoting more sustainable logistics within Dundee. The other project is the Lamelo project, uh, and we're still working on the development of an urban consolidation centre covering Dundee and Perth. Uh, and hope to have something positive on that, certainly, next year. Great. Thank you. Councillor Stockton, did you want to come in? Yes, thank you very much. Just very much value the opportunity to come and speak. Um, I've got a personal passion about uh, transport and freight, having a past life of being involved in, in that, and now uh, you know, to come and speak for the Regional Transport Partnership, I think it's really important, as you know, the high trans area is half the landmass of Scotland. We serve the most difficult places to reach. 100 islands, but only a tenth of the population. The whole region, I believe, wants to be contributing to the national picture, but the freight structure that we have and the legacy we've got needs massive investment for us to be able to compete on a genuine basis with everyone else. 
because the world is moving on. Uh, we use all modes of transport to export freight. We use air, rail, road and sea transport. And, you know, just because of the vastness of the ge geographical area, different solutions have got to be found for different things. And our transport system is becoming much more fragile as the world moves on. When I was first involved moving things around, there was a, you know, the, the saying just in time came along for goods and deliveries and getting to market. It's kind of moved on now to just in the nick of time. And these time scales are getting more and more difficult to meet. So I just feel that we need to look because when we don't, when our infrastructure fails, as you can hear on the television with landslips and, and ferries now come in the empty supermarkets, there's fresh fish and lobsters and all the rest. They don't make their market. We become more vulnerable as a community, even than we are at present. And we must make sure that we cover all these things and the investment is really important so that we can remain a contributory part of the country and to make sure that things happen in the right way with the right investment for the future. Really interested uh, from our organisation to come and contribute to this inquiry. I know you've read the submissions, so I'm not going to say anything more. I'm really interested in the questions that you might have from them. Um, I'm sure we'll come on to the issue of investment. Mr McRae, do you have anything to add? Um, no, no, just a, a couple of points in terms of our practical sort of engagement on, um, on freight. We have a freight forum um, which brings together obviously the private stakeholders and, and also the, the, the local politicians, which I think is important. And on top of that, there's also um, rail and ferry user groups which provide you know opportunities for, for uh, hauliers to contribute and, and engage with other stakeholders in the area in terms of raising their concerns. Um, and on top of that, maybe just draw attention to a number of the projects which are referenced in the submission, but similarly to, to Sestrans, we've been involved in um, European projects such as Lifting the Spirit, which we we'll maybe talk about later, but also bits of research um, in terms of a freight capability study that we, that we carried out in 2010, which has hopefully helped inform some of the investment that Network Rail will be carrying out on the Highland Main Line and, and the Far and North West Lines. OK, thank you. And finally, Mr Matthews. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm here as chair of um, uh, Transform Scotland, which is the National Alliance for Sustainable Transport. So our members are the major rail, bus and ferry companies, public bodies and local national groups campaigning for public transport, walking and cycling. Um, I think our, our primary interest is in encouraging a, a transport policy that's sustainable in, in the widest economic, social and environmental sense and which reduces the negative uh, impacts of, uh, of transport policy. Uh, our primary focus is really on uh, passenger transport and, and walking and cycling. Um, we, we collaborate a lot with the Rail Freight Group. I know I've given, given evidence to you uh, specifically on, on some of these issues. Uh, but I, I think uh, <coughs> one of our main thrusts is on investment in infrastructure and in inv investment in infrastructure that encourages more sustainable transport modes. And clearly that has implications both for passenger transport and for, uh, for rail uh, freight and, and freight as well. So our primary support is for rail freight and also seaborne and canal-based transport where that's, where that's appropriate. And really, just to finish off, I think, just to reflect on, on the reasons for that, road, the road haulage industry has a, a very significant impact in all sorts of ways. We know that uh, HGVs contribute adversely in terms of road safety. There's an awful lot of accidents involving HGVs. We know that one freight train can move 50 to 60 uh, lorries off the roads. We know that rail freight only has about a quarter of the carbon emissions per tonne carried compared to, to road and about a tenth of the particulate and, and uh, NOx emissions, which, given the concern about air quality at the moment, is obviously another significant issue. And I think the final point to make is that HEVs are a major contributor to wear and tear on the roads. We've been running a campaign recently on the poor state of repair of a lot of our roads as a £2.2 .2 billion pound backlog. HGVs contribute a lot to the damage to our road infrastructure. And so all these things we'd like to see taken into account in appraising uh, the outcomes and encouraging more sustainable modes of route freight transport wherever possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mary, you have some questions. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about infrastructure um, obstacles to the, the, the free movement of, of freight. And one thing that the committee has been keen to do through this inquiry is to identify the main obstacles to that free flow. So can I ask each of you in turn how, how you would prioritise what your most pressing difficulty is and how we could overcome it? Okay, right. 
two issues here. Um, uh, uh, one, one being infrastructure obstacles and one being operational obstacles. And, and I think there is a major operational obstacle um, which is discouraging the use of rail freight and discouraging the use of short sea shipping um, as the two uh, more sustainable modes, uh, particularly for longer distance freight movements. Um, and that's information. It's actually very difficult to get um, information on uh, services for rail freight, and it's difficult to get information on services for short sea shipping. Um, anyone can go onto a website um, and find a website that will tell them all the public transport services that they need for the journey that they want. A common platform exists for passenger transport. We don't have a common platform for freight transport. And that, that, that seems to us to be a, a, a significant barrier. Um, there are a number of, of, of specific infrastructure um, areas where, where you know, the, the A1, for example, down to the northeast of England, um, where um, a lot of the, the freight uh, uh, short sea shipping movements uh, are, are, are based, um, really needs to be upgraded uh, to a dual carriageway standard um, on both sides um, of, of the Scottish border. Um, on, on a more local um, um, base for the Sestran uh, region, we have been campaigning for a long number of years for the completion of the A801 uh, M8 M9 link, which provides the link from central Scotland um, and freight facilities down uh, to Grangemouth. It's a particularly bad uh, section of it there. Um, and of course, the Edinburgh City Bypass is a continuing thorn in our flesh. Um, and it's just as much a thorn for freight movement as it is. In, in terms of rail freight, I won't go on about rail freight because I know that you're hearing uh, uh, from Network Rail uh, later this morning. But in terms of, of short sea shipping, um, it, it seems to us there are structural problems in short sea shipping. When you look at the competition in mainland Europe, they tend to be either public sector owned or public private partnership uh, basis. So that when the port itself wants to expand, there is the immediate public sector support to provide the connectivity either by rail uh, or, or by inland uh, waterways. There are size li limitations, um, particularly in our area in Grangemouth and Leith. There are access limitations, both tidal access limitations for 24-hour access and operational issues um, associated with that. Um, and, and again, coming back to this, centralised information uh, system is what we need. I mean, there are other issues about the frequency of Recife to Zeebrugge set ferry service as well. That will only become more frequent as the utilisation of short sea shipping um, increases. And, and in terms of air, uh, we tend to forget the role of air in terms of freight movement. Um, in, Edinburgh, in our region, Edinburgh Airport's the busiest not only the busiest passenger airport in Scotland, it's also the busiest freight airport in Scotland. And that's a combination of either dedicated freight uh, planes with the dedicated freight depot um, at the east side of, of Edinburgh Airport, but also there is an increasing ability now for um, um, more use of longer haul services in Scotland um, and using the hold space in these longer haul services for high value, um, low weight um, um, freight facilities. So there are a number of, of, of issues. As I say, I won't go into rail. Um, we do have our own local issues in terms of rail, as well as the national issues in terms of uh, gauge issues and electrification issues. Um, but I'll leave that to, to Network Rail mm. to deal with later. When you talk about a centralised information system, who do you think should facilitate the setting up of that? I, I think it should be a government-based um, 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 initiative. <clears throat> I think um, one of, one of the, the, the sort of um, anomalies in the current uh, devolution settlement um, is that Scottish Parliament, as you know, has the responsibility for ports and harbours, but you don't have the responsibility for international movements. Um, so that remains with the Department for Transport down in Westminster, who are not particularly interested in whether a ship lands in Scotland or a ship lands in England, as long as it lands in the UK somewhere. Um, 
And it always has seemed to us that there is a case for, in a Scottish context, having much more hands-on involvement in international uh, movements, both passenger and freight. Um, now, if we are to look at moving freight from road-based, and, and to be honest, the vast majority of road-based transport is local, um, and, and the vast majority of that is within Scotland as well, as we all know. The proportion of it, which is longer distance in road, is much lower than it is proportionally with rail and, and shipping. Um, but the volumes are still greater um, than rail or shipping. Um, so the, the issue with that is it's an information system which is needed to identify and allow bookings on longer distance uh, movements to get that mode shift. You, don't, you won't get the mode shift for the last mile other than sort of local shift to different um, fuels and so on. But there is a real potential for mode shift to rail and, sh and, and shipping for longer distance services. That's where we get into the international issues here. Um, and, and a regional authority can't do that. We've, we've done our bit. We've published as much as we could in terms of the availability of, of, of freight depots for rail and, and services and so on. But it doesn't give that centralised platform for information and ease of booking and ease of paying the, the charges and comparing different carriers and so on. Um, and really, I think, if you're strapped for cash, it's not a big capital investment to produce that. Um, and the potential benefits to the rail, to, to the, the freight logistics industry would be, in our view, quite considerable. And, and that, it, it really needs to be a centrally, either Scottish government-based or UK government-based uh, initiative. Okay. Just before I move on to the, to the rest of the panel, one thing that has been identified in previous sessions is the last mile. The last mile is one of the biggest obstacles in, in the free flow. Is that something you agree with? I, I, I do agree with that. Um, and I think it's a very difficult nut to crack um, because we do have um, a, a, a patently obvious clash between environmental considerations, noise considerations, pollution considerations, and efficient last mile uh, movements. Um, I don't know whether you noticed, but PTEG, the, 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 the organisation in England, the public sector transport organisation, published a report just last week, or just in fact, I think it was, sorry, I might, I'm exaggerating there, I think it was February. It's a very good urban logistics report with case studies throughout the UK of good examples of how to address uh, the issue. Um, but if we are to be successful in improving urban logistics, we need to address the issue that logistics operators are faced with congestion in the urban areas. Um, they are also um, using vehicles which are polluting within the urban areas. The air quality management areas are suffering from freight, the way, as well as all the other uh, types of traffic. So there needs to be a mechanism, and Mike mentioned the uh, uh, TAC Trans uh, initiative for a, 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 an urban freight consolidation distribution centre and that's really what we need to get and that needs also to be combined with a good location close to the urban area so that alternative modes are viable and sensible so that you can use electric vehicles that have a limited uh, mileage capability, you can use electric bikes and electric trikes to get into the sort of narrow streets and the pedestrianised areas. And, and I think it is a difficult nut to crack because if you look at local authority policies, it has been very restrictive of freight um, in urban areas, giving priority quite rightly to pedestrians, giving priority to public transport, giving priority to cyclists and so on. And, and, and freight's sort of down the pecking order in that. And it, was ever thus, and I think it is a difficult issue. The last mile is, is a difficult nut to crack. Um, that's where um, local authorities and regional authorities have the potential to have a much more proactive uh, role in, in, in addressing that. Okay, thank you. Can I move on to Mr Cairns? Yes, um, I think if anything, we'd probably say, just picking up on the last points there, that the operational issues are perhaps bigger than the infrastructure ones. Uh, in that the issues like air quality and so on arise from urban logistics. 
Within the Tactron region, generally, the, the network is pretty good. Uh, the A90 is dual throughout. The A9 is dual or is planned to be upgraded and dualed. Um, in terms of roads, <coughs> the, the only constraint really, which is identified in STPR but doesn't actually have a, a program date for it, is the A90 through all around Dundee. Uh, and that's the Kingsway and Forfa Road in Dundee, uh, which suffers congestion during the daytime, and particularly in the peak periods, uh, when commuters uh, collide with uh, through movements to the northeast. Um, in terms of rail, as I said previously, we, we don't actually have any rail freight facilities within the region. Um, a, a possible location has been identified at the port of Dundee, uh, but it's very much identifying a particular user and then funding and looking in the region about £5 million to develop that sort of facility. Uh, the ports are a bit of a mixed bag. Montrose has seen a, a considerable amount of investment uh, and has been significantly upgraded, including using Freight Facilities Grant over the past five to ten years or so. At the other end is, is Perth, which has uh, a need for investment uh, but has declining tonnage so there's a bit of a conundrum there in terms of do you put the investment in and hopefully turn around the decline in the port or will the decline continue um, coming back to the operational issues uh, i think it is very much more that a big issue certainly within the region in dundee and perth and again in the newly uh, designated air quality management area in Creef is actually road freight movements. Uh, and if anything, that's probably a, a bigger priority than, than just the infrastructure. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr McCray, Mr Stockton. Chip in for, uh, first on this. Um, I, I agree with uh, Alec and Mike in terms of it's a mix of um, infrastructure and operational issues. Just to, um, without wanting to, to provide a long list, but maybe to touch on a few of these in terms of the um, the important ones with respect to our area um, by mode um, I obviously touched on the, the rail issue in terms of um, the single track constraints and gauge restrictions on the Highland Main Line um, and, and the barriers that is to passenger um, uh, freight as well as actual uh, material and goods um, but also other weight restrictions of that in the far north and west lines that are, that are also a problem um, so we're obviously looking forward to the investment from Network Rail, hopefully in control period five for for, for upgrades there. In terms of the road, um, uh, we'd obviously welcome the, the investment plan for the A9 and A96. But what, what that in essence does is draw attention to those other, other parts of the network, which um, uh, is parts of the Highlands are reliant on before they can get onto these roads. So just to draw attention, a couple of examples, the A95, which is the road from Elgin to Aviemoor, which is takes a, an enormous amount of whisky freight, obviously, each year, which uh, enormous value of export to the to the Scottish economy. Um, and we had an example of a haulier there who said he'd, he'd spent £20,000 on wing mirror replacements just in the last year um, due to problems with the actual carriageway. Um, we've tried to work with, um, we understand there's obviously not going to be the same investment maybe for the A9 and A96, but we've tried to work with the local council there to de develop some sh shovel-ready schemes. And we've done similar for like the, the spinal route in the Western Isles. Um, in terms of air, um, access to Heathrow is obviously of vital importance f for the Highlands, and that's something that we've put through our submissions to the, the Airports Commission. Um, uh, a, a fact on that is that 95% of um, all long-haul seafood still goes through Heathrow, and obviously all that's coming from, um, you know, or a significant element from the Highlands and Islands area. And it's how do we get, you know, the problems, logistical problems of getting it to Heathrow. Um, and finally, in terms of ferry, I'm sure James will have more to say on this, but just capacity is is an issue um, and becoming ever, ever more on on our uh, regular um, ferry services to both to Orkney and to, to the Western Isles. And um, you've got the problem there of competing demands in terms of passenger expectations and also freight requirements, obviously, um, which can lead to, you know, issues like block booking and, uh, you know, deck space. So, um, and and is, that, is that 
seasonal thing? Is it worse in the summer? or? It, it is, but we've actually done a piece of work on this in order to understand that demand. And what we found is that it's growing. So it's growing to you know peak periods from like Friday through to Monday, but but extends now into October, Christmas and, and Easter holiday periods as well. So it's, it's a growing problem. Okay. Yeah, just, just to, to what Neil said, there's just some of the modal shift stuff we... Because rail is a real opportunity for the very far north of Scotland to move from some of the stuff taking things long, longer by ship and, and burning more carbon, it's very difficult to start into that process because of the restrictions, because you've got to look at it as, as a commercial operation. I'm quite sure there's opportunity if you can open up rail overnight to make sure you've got daily service and there's a whole lot of things on signalling and, and bits and pieces, but also being able to support that because... As far as Europe's concerned, the whole argument about territorial cohesion comes in and we should be able to support that some way through more of the programmes from Europe to make sure that we get a, a thing, you know, I'm looking at Mike Nodden there, but, you know, even Oban getting overnight freight on the rail takes it off the road, huge advantages. You've got a short supplementary and then Dave, I think, wants to come in. Just on that point, because I know Councillor Stockton's got some quite, you know, um, uh, radical ideas and ambitious ideas and, and could you just be a bit more specific then about what you'd like to see in terms of improving rail? Well, I've got a personal a hobby horse that I believe that the far north of Scotland particularly, Caithness, 25,000 population in Orkney on top of that, another 20,000, is a long, long way away from the centre here. We did some freight for supermarkets by rail. That stopped because the the, 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 the chains moved on. It's no longer a safe waste when they did this stuff. But we've got a real opportunity to have an overnight service both ways. And I would add on to that a bit of sleeper because there's going to be 85 sleeper carriages available shortly, motor rail. Making a combination train and taking stuff up, I think it's a huge opportunity to connect the periphery with the centre of the country in a, in a radical way. But you need to actually be able to put investment in with that and you've actually got to free up some of the, the blockages. Thank you. No, fine, OK. May. Uh, yes, yeah, so first of all, just echo... A few of the points have been made already. I think um, uh, that last point about uh, encouraging supermarkets, big organisations to, to commit to rail, that's a good thing. The marginal costs between rail and road might be different and it's about the corporate statement of intent. That's always worthwhile. Uh, I think the points made about last mile, uh, the last mile challenges and so on, and, and urban transport, clearly that's a big issue. I wouldn't pretend there's um, a, a very easy solution that would be applicable everywhere, but I think, as has been alluded to already, we have some good practice examples from elsewhere, and let's let's think about that and think about the use of electric vehicles and, and other means. Um, uh, and information as well, I think that's an important point as well. Let's have a system that's very easy to use in terms of uh, rail freight as well. In terms of infrastructure itself, um, I think we'd see a few key things as, as, as needing some, some action. Um, in terms of the, the rail freight terminals in Scotland, uh, Grange, Mouth, Moss End and Cope Bridge, there is a need for some investment there, particularly at Cope Bridge. Uh, we, we know that could enhance capacity and also enhance the uh, efficiency of operation of those centres. We also know there's a lot of pinch points on the rail network in terms of rail freight just now. Some of those between Grangemouth and, and uh, Aberdeen, um, single track bottlenecks, um, gauge restrictions in terms of tunnels and tunnels and bridges and so on, and, and some action there would be very welcome. And again, as the, the, the previous speakers from the Highlands have alluded to, we have an awful lot of single tracks still within uh, Scotland, which is challenging for, for rail. So we want to see passing and crossover loops, uh, ideally of at least 775 metres to allow long freight trains to do that. And we need a general enhancement and a lot of investment in rail uh, that would benefit passengers, would also benefit freight operation and talk about electrification and dual tracking where that's appropriate as well. And I, I think the last, last point to make is that there is a, we've, we've heard about the A9 and the A96 corridors, and there is a huge amount of public money being committed to uh, action there over the, the coming 10, 15 years or so, about $3 billion on the A9, another $3 billion on the A96, and a smaller amount on, on uh, the rail uh, infrastructure. Uh, I think, from our point of view, we don't see any evidence there was an integrated appraisal done of the whole corridor for the A9, for example, looking at the, the differences. I mean, as somebody who's 
uses the A9, I know that a lot of frustrations I think a lot of people have is the amount of HGVs there. Clearly, action on the rail would remove some of that problem. We know also that the journey from Inverness to Edinburgh is the optimum one, really, for business users for rail. Too short for flights, but if you had an upgraded rail system, you could you could get a lot of business users on the train because it's more user-friendly in terms of working practices than, than the road. That would take a lot of people off. So why, why weren't we thinking really about the two together? What needs to be enhanced in terms of road? What needs to be enhanced in terms of rail? And what could deliver the widest and best outcomes environmental, socially, uh, and uh, economically? And that, that would apply as much to investment that benefit rail freight as to, to benefit passenger services. OK, thank you. Can I move on now to ask you about your relationship with freight operators? Uh, and, and if any of you have any good examples of how you've worked with them to encourage a more efficient operation, but also if you work with them to help them to reduce their emissions. And can I start by asking Mr Matthews that question? Uh, well, as I said, our, our focus is, is more on the, the um, pa passenger transport rather than on freight. So I, I wouldn't claim to have any direct relationship with them. I think it's been interesting reading some of the evidence submitted now about the, the sense that a lot of um, uh, people have that it's quite difficult to, to use rail freight and so on. And, and the stats are that rail freight's increased about 70% since privatisation. So something is happening. There is some growth there. Um, it seems that there are, there are some issues raised in terms of how the market works. It might be information, as has been touched on already. It might be in terms of how how the, the system works. I think a key challenge for freight providers is that they are generally seeking long-term contracts where the demand is very much for short-term reactive transport. And I think that's a challenge. Some of the infrastructure investment we'd like to see in, in the the, the rail freight industry might alleviate in, uh, some of these issues and make the make the system more responsive. I think also, in particular, on, on lines in northern Scotland where the, the freight volumes might be lower, there may be a case for freight providers to collaborate more, uh, offering joint services than they do just now. So, I think there are some challenges there from the industry, but I, I wouldn't claim to have any any insights beyond that. Mr. McCauley. Thanks. Well, like, like my like my colleagues and the other art. TPs, we do have a freight quality partnership which meets um, just again about every six months. Um, <clears throat> what we have done with that, I mean, the, the, the attendance at that is, is not just public sector, but we have the ports, the airport, road haulage operators, and so on uh, involved in the freight quality partnership. And, and what we um, tend to do with the freight quality partnership, rather than just simply tell them what we're doing, is to ask them what their problems are. Um, and as a result of that um, came uh, the work that we did for a freight um, uh, review uh, of the Sestrand region. Out of that uh, came a freight map uh, for the region, which identified not just preferred routes for road haulage, but identified where the rest areas were, a review of the quality of the rest areas, um, and the utilisation of the rest areas and why they're not as widely used as you would expect them to be. Um, so we've worked um, on that basis uh, with through the Freight Quality Partnership, uh, but also we engaged with the road haulage industry um, when the first threats came to the Rasaif to Zeebrugge Ferry um, at the time when uh, 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 Superfast pulled out uh, how could we encourage the industry to make, a, a, first of all, lobby for the reinstatement of the service? And once the service was reinstated, what were the key issues for them that would encourage them back on um, to the Recite to Zeebrugge Ferry uh, rather than heading off down to Newcastle or the northeast of England um, or indeed further south? Um, and, and interestingly, what came out of that... Um, we expected that it would be the cost that would be the key factor for them, but it wasn't. The key factor for them was, one, the quality of service. They were never very happy with the previous operator's uh, handling of their trucks, and they, the trucks get damaged on, on the, the boat, whereas the new operators are, are much better at, at, uh, than that. Um, but also the frequency of the service, the timing of the service, um, and the turnaround time between Zeebrugge 
and their destinations elsewhere in Europe in order to get to where they've got to go and get back to catch the next um, the next boat uh, back to Scotland, ship, sorry, the next ship back to Scotland. So we worked very uh, well with the, the freight industry on that, that area. Um, we have um, um, participated also uh, with, through our European projects, with a number of freight operators who are actually uh, bringing uh, goods and services into Scotland from mainland Europe. And one of the key issues that, that we were quite active on over the last 18 months or so was the Sulphur Directive um, for the North Sea, uh, which, as you know, was reducing the level of sulphur emissions dramatically, and it's now in place. Um, and there were big concerns, uh, and, and, and we lobbied with uh, the now Cabinet Secretary um, to see what could be done. And as a result of that, he, 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 he chaired a couple of um, um, sessions in Victoria Quay uh, to raise the, the, the awareness in the industry and raise the issues. Uh, it's, I think it's fair to say that it hasn't been quite as disastrous as it might have been um, in terms of freight costs because it's coincided with the reduction in the cost of, of uh, oil-based fuel. So one has been compensating against the other. The, the, the low sulphur fuels are more expensive, but they're still cheaper because uh, of the base uh, reduction in the price of a barrel of oil. Um, so we've worked um, reasonably well with them. And, and I think, to be honest, it's fair to say we could do more. Um, and, and at the moment, um, we are now um, getting, rather than our freight quality partnership being chaired by someone from Sestran, it will at the next one be chaired by um, uh, the ex-director Scotland and the Road Haulage Association um, in the shape of Phil Flanders. And Phil is very enthusiastic and he's keen to get letters out via the Road Haulage Association, Freight Transport Association, to all the operators. And again, what are your issues, guys? Um, rather than here are the European projects that we have been involved in. Uh, and, and freight. Is there a willingness amongst the operators to work together to increase efficiency because they are in competition with each they, other? They, and yeah, and how, how can you facilitate that? This is to keep their answers as brief and as succinct as possible because we've only got just over half an hour for the rest of the session. Thanks, Chairman. I'm not renowned for, for brevity and you could, should keep reminding me for that. Get a clock in front of me. Um, but uh, uh, you raise a particular issue in terms of competition. Um, and we firmly believe that there is a need for a neutral platform. We're very keen to promote the idea in the fourth estuary of uh, a gateway, which would involve all the operators, uh, ports, airports, road, rail, that do business within that area, in a joint management structure leading towards an accreditation of a sustainable logistics gateway. Um, and that's been tried elsewhere in Europe, and it's getting picked up elsewhere in Europe. And we don't want to see Scotland lagging behind on that. But to achieve that, there needs to be a neutral platform where operators can share good ideas in a position of trust where they don't feel that as soon as they mention their operations, the guy across the table goes away and pinches their customer. And that's a big, big issue, particularly with road haulage and, and, and to a certain extent with rail haulage uh, as well. And, and there is a reluctance, and it, and it leads to the situation where, which Mike mentioned, where there is a serious lack of robust information on which to make sensible choices in terms of freight logistics because the information is all commercially sensitive and there's a real reluctance to share on it. We believe firmly there is a need for that, and you're, you're quite right to bring it up. Mary, I, I apologies. I think we're going to have to move on to question uh, four. Um, Dave. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, can, I ask, can I ask you about um, sources of funding? Uh, so, for example, are freight grant schemes working in helping um, getting freight off our roads? Uh, and if they are, perhaps the panel could tell the committee why there's been no awards for freight facilities grants since 2011. Who would like to kick off? Mr. Kearns. Uh, yes, certainly. In terms of funding, um, looking at alternative sources, we've found Europe to be a very useful source of funding. 
Um, there is a catch there in that we always have to get match funding to match. Uh, one project we're involved in provided 75% funding, the other 50% funding. Um, finding the match funding can be an issue at times, uh, but certainly Europe can, can assist in that. In terms of fleet facilities, um, it's possibly not just the, the grant itself that's an issue. Um, we've worked with Highland Spring in Blackford in Persia for some years now on uh, supporting the development of a railhead. Uh, and knowing what has happened within the company, it's, it's possibly not, ironically in this case, the funding has been an issue. It's just been the, the company having the right opportunity to develop it because they've been involved in uh, company takeovers and mergers and so on uh, and it's perhaps something that just goes towards the bottom of the list uh, when they're looking at reorganizing the, the logistics function as they take over the companies and as the market changes uh, but certainly there are a number of issues i think with fleet facilities plant um, one is it, it can only be subject to an application from the private sector and there may well be occasions where perhaps the public sector, for example, could take a lead on it. That currently isn't permitted with, with FFG. So some revisions there might help. And I think the time scale at times can, can be a bit difficult to work to as well. If we could try and get a more user-friendly type of FFG, then that might be a better take-up. It could work better, yeah. yes, yeah. And in, and in fairness, um, there obviously have been awards for the Waterborne grants. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in Corpac, for example, I think it was 900,000 was successful. Yeah. Mr McCray will be familiar with that. Mm -hmm. But it did concern, I think, the committee when we looked at the records and found no awards since 2011 for FFG, that clearly something's not working here. Uh, I think we got evidence from the chief exec of Montrose Harbour um, and I think he was saying that they employed a consultant who worked it through and they got the grant, but that was prior to 2011. Does any of the other panel members have any... Uh, I'll touch on Europe in, that, in my next question, but in the uh, domestic grant applications, has anyone else got any experience with FFG, Mr McCauley? Just, just, just a, sorry, so just a small point, Chair. I, I think some of the feedback we've had from the road haulagers, road haulage industry is where... Um, they would quite like to shift onto, freight, onto rail freight. Um, they find that in order to make the case for rail freight, there has to be a relatively long-term business case associated with it. And a lot of the business on road freight is short-term. Um, um, you know, it's short-term contracts. It's done by phone and so on. If we could get a mechanism where shifting onto rail is easier for that type of business... I think it would certainly help. And of course, it is important that we look at joined up government. This is, I think it's important we don't say we've got transport over here and we've got climate change legislation on the other hand. Clearly, if we can get freight um, off the road and onto rail, we're going to do wonders for our climate change targets, which we haven't actually achieved, have we, in the last, uh, in the last few years? Has anyone any, any other experience about FFG and other types of grants before I move on to European funding models? I was going to say some more, but given the time scales, I'm happy for you to move on because some of them have been covered already. Could I touch then, uh, convener, on the experience of sourcing uh, other types of funding uh, via the European Union, for example, uh, TNT, uh, Marco Polo, and Interreg? And I think there was some suggestion, uh, I think, in the evidence about the lifting of the spirit uh, experience. Mr. McCray, perhaps your best place to talk on that. Yes, maybe kick off on that one. I, th I think lifting the spirit is a really good example of of where EU funding's been. Um, uh, well applied. We did a, a whiskey, whiskey logistics study um, some time ago that identified the requirements of the, the whiskey industry in order for them to shift from road to rail and that helped them form an application for the Lifting the Spirit project which was a, um, it received an intervention rate of 65%. Um, before going on to the detail of the project just to say that I, I, there have been other opportunities for that and I think um, in terms of EU funding, what, what we would find, rather than everyone putting their hand up and saying we, we need more money, I think it, in terms of a practical mechanism, it would be good to know that there was a pot that you could apply into if, when the opportunities arise, because they can arise at any time, um, and it's to have that flexibility, because we've, we've been able to bring in significant um, you know, external funding, and we'd, we'd like to you know, do that in, in future if possible. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one point, and over as an issue in time. I'm very enthusiastic about lifting the spirit, which clearly was about bulk whisky. 
I had a Highlands and Islands regional issue, which perhaps you could touch on, and that was um, I was visiting Glenranji in Tain, and they were mentioning that all the whisky barrels, which the panel will know, uh, come from the States because uh, the bourbon barrels can only be used once. It's more efficient to ship them to Grangemouth. And I was saying to them, well, why don't you ship them to Invergordon, which reduces the amount of road? Because currently it all goes to Grangemouth and they're all trucked uh, north and to uh, Murray and so on. Have you looked at that aspect of transport? It seems to me a bit daft that we're shipping them there when we could be shipping them to a, ne a nearby port. And Invergordon port instead, it does have the facilities for that. Um, in terms of the specifics, I wouldn't, wouldn't be certain, but I think it, probably, it might well be gauge issues in terms of, you know, the, the load from Elgin to Grangemouth was taken via Aberdeen, and it might be the practicalities of actually taking it um, on the Elgin to Inverness section that is, is actually the factor. Um, but if, I've, if I can supply with more information on that, I will do. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else got any other experience of European uh, funding? Mr McCauley? Chair, we've, we've been involved heavily with Interreg, um, and, and mainstream ERDF uh, for a number of projects. I think the key issue with that is if you think the bureaucracy associated with the rail freight grant is difficult, try doing a European project because it is absolutely outrageous, the amount of uh, bureaucracy involved in European projects. And I'll give you a prime example. If you attend a meeting in a European project by air, you need to keep the boarding pass. The actual confirmation of the booking is not good enough. You need to take photographs of yourself at the meeting. It's absolutely insulting to professional people the amount of bureaucracy in European projects. Um, so I think anything that the Scottish Government can do to encourage the EU to simplify their bureaucracy uh, uh, would be a, a major advantage there. And by comparison... We've had very good experience of, for example, the Bus Improvement Fund. I know it's not the subject of this inquiry, but they still have targets to reach. They still have the requirement for a submission, but the administration of that by the by the colleagues in Transport Scotland has been streets ahead of the administration of any European project we've ever been involved in. And all credit to the Scottish Government and Transport Scotland uh, uh, people for administering these grants much more efficiently and, and sensibly um, than, mm. than, than the European Commission does. OK, Mr Matthews, have you had any experience of European funding? Uh, nothing really to add. I mean, I'm very supportive of lifting the spirit. I think that was an excellent project and shows what can be done. But um, I think the points I'd raised have all been covered already. OK, any other members wish to contribute? Yes, uh, as Alex said, the bureaucracy is, is quite breathtaking at times. Uh, especially for what can be quite small sums of money. Um, the, the two problems, I suppose, with Europe is one, the, the match funding issue, uh, and the other is, is the programming. Um, and generally speaking, you get fairly short notice of when the, uh, a funding opportunity arises. So you've got to have a scheme that's just at the right stage to then be able to apply for that. And then there are the issues, quite rightly, uh, a lot of projects are transnational, of actually finding partners in the rest of Europe uh, who also have schemes just at that exact time in, in the right sort, of, uh, right sort of fields. So it, it can be challenging from that point of view. Has anyone any experience of the Marco Polo funding? Um, some time ago we were involved in the Marco Polo bid um, mm. for a service from Norway to Recife, to Zeebrugge, uh, stopping off at Shetland uh, on, on the way. Uh, we submitted two bids on that. We had had to go through a procurement process to get an operator on board uh, at the very outset of it, so it was a considerable upfront investment of it. Um, the first bid failed because we didn't apply for enough money. Um, misinterpretation of, of the rules. The second bid failed... Um, primarily uh, because the Commission felt that the, the leg across between Recife and Zeebrugge was in competition with commercial services and therefore it, it, it failed. Um, we didn't have the opportunity to go for a third bid to actually solve these problems because our partners in Norway uh, lost interest and, and people moved on. Um, so um, the Marco Polo and, and Motorways of the Sea um, is not easy um, but other countries seem to be able to do it much better than the UK does. Um, and I think there is, to be honest, much more government support for these types of bids. 
um, in countries like Spain, countries like Italy, where they're much more successful in getting waterways of the sea. Uh, I'm very conscious of time and convenience, so I'll finish on, on that, but I think perhaps that's some food for thought for the committee to raise with the Minister when he comes to our committee in uh, a few weeks. Thank, thank you. you. James, you have some questions. Yes, thank you. Convener, uh, we've already touched on the urban consolidation centres, uh, but do you have any other comments about the pros and cons of such schemes and their how they could be applied in the Scottish context, and further to that, the night deliveries, how you see the benefits of that, any barriers there are, and how you could, what, what you would suggest to help remove those barriers? Certainly the benefits have got to be significant. I'll just quickly quote some figures. Uh, in Dundee, between 7 in the morning and 7 at night, uh, 2,007 commercial vehicles enter the city centre. Uh, putting that into context, it's actually not the HGVs. There are only 22 articulated vehicles. It's actually the smaller white vans. It's just under 1,700 of those entering Dundee city centre every day. And that sector is growing. Um, a lot of those are not well loaded. The logistics sector is very efficient within individual companies and for individual customers. Uh, but across the whole sector, there are a lot of lightly loaded vehicles working exclusively for one customer. Uh, so we can see that there is significant scope there to reduce the number of vehicles and consequent benefits in terms of carbon emissions. I just come in at this point, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, Mr Cairns, yep. because that does kind of lead you on to another question I was going to ask about collaboration. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you see any scope for that and, and any sort of a suggestion of people moving forward on that? Yeah, I think it's, it's really got to be uh, led by the public sector. Uh, it is a very competitive business, and as we found uh, w with our experiences with uh, trying to develop consolidation centres in, in Perth and Dundee, the private sector is very protective of its own market. Uh, we've been through an exercise where we went out to tender to try to identify a logistics operator to set up a consolidation centre in Perth. That ultimately failed. I'd just very briefly say that that's actually not an uncommon experience. Uh, in one of the European projects we've been involved in, actually in London, uh, London Road of Camden, uh, put in a consolidation centre for the council's procured goods. So it wasn't one open to the market, open to retailers and so on. Uh, their initial advertisement attracted 15 operators, but when they actually put the tenders out, they only received two tenders. So that's the sort of market that we work in. There's, there's one or two operators who are very interested in consolidation, uh, but almost across Europe, it's just not attracting uh, the operators themselves to invest in it or to look at it. Uh, we've taken a different approach, and I understand that you've, you've been to the Netherlands and met with Beninstad Service. Uh, through the European project, we've actually worked with Beninstad Service and had some events in Perth to try to attract entrepreneurs in. And we're hoping that we've been successful in that. We've got a social enterprise company based in Dundee that is actively developing a business plan to produce, uh, to introduce consolidation in Dundee and Perth. Uh, we've introduced them to other smaller logistics companies. And we are hopeful that by trying to develop something organically, something fairly local that won't be seen as a threat by the larger operators, uh, that, that can go from very small beginnings serving five or six shops. It can develop in a similar way that the Binnenstad service in the Netherlands has done. So we would see that as the way forward. And I think the experiences generally across Europe seem to be that it's, it's difficult to get the established logistics operators actually interested. Do you also have any comments on that? Well, the stuff. The my, my final question then is round about the carbon emission targets uh, and the use of technology. The, obviously, some of that technology has the potential to make freight transport more efficient, less costly, more sustainable, and also along with the integration and collaboration. Can you describe for the committee your experience in, in pulling together some of these to make uh, things more sustainable? Briefly, Chair, I promise. Um, We've had a couple of fairly significant initiatives on that. As part of one of our European projects, we carried out a review of best practice 
uh, for logistics operators, um, which identified best practice across not only the UK but across uh, Europe with some examples of that. Um, and as a result of that review, uh, we produced a set of guidelines for the industry, which is effectively a checklist. It's like a QA checklist, um, and it's targeted at those who procure logistics, um, those who operate logistics, because what the two different sides of the market can actually do is different uh, depending on, on, on how they're operating. Those guidelines have been uh, published as part of the European project. They're on our website. Um, but again, uh, uh, it, it, it is a drop in the ocean in terms of getting um, the uh, visibility that we really need uh, throughout the industry. But one of the other areas of interest that, that was of interest to us, and, and, and one of the um, barriers to, to shifting uh, to rail and shifting on to short sea shipping, is being able to track and know exactly where your load is at any given time of the day. You can do that with road. All you need to do is phone the, the driver on his mobile phone and he'll tell you where he is. Um, but um, we've uh, worked with European partners in, develop, in developing more track and trace, and I know that that exists throughout the industry in various different um, uh, bespoke uh, uh, facilities. This would have been a track and trace that would be available open platform uh, for all. And also the development of a... Uh, a route planner, a, a multimodal route planner. Um, and, and that, again, would be available on the web and available uh, throughout the industry. The downside with that particular initiative is actually getting the information for the route planning, uh, because the route planner is not just about availability of services and frequency of services, it's also about prices as well. And actually getting that information from the operator to go on to an open platform is uh, very, very difficult uh, uh, just now. So all of these and, and all of this, the types of work that we've been doing in, in our European project are all aimed at trying to get the carbon reductions, um, uh, are, uh, achieve the carbon reduction targets um, of, of the government, which I have to say will not at all be easy in the transport sector. Does anybody else have any comments on that? Yeah, just uh, just one or two things. I just think there's you know a lot of work going on to make on ferries and things to make them much, you know, get the technology right to make sure that we get, you know, to get the carbon reductions in there. And one of the things that I do think needs to be looked at is where there is government intervention and support to make sure that we look to the future and make sure that we're going for the lowest carbon option on that. And I do think there's a, a fair bit of work to be done there. But we are beginning to look at some of these things too. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, Adam, you have some questions. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, can I ask the, the, pa uh, the panel basically what they think the highest priority is for government spending on infrastructure uh, from the perspective of improving freight logistics in Scotland? Highest priority? My highest priority would be an open platform for uh, information booking and comparison of different services for um, multimodal uh, freight movements. Um, and as I said before, I don't think as an investment by government that is uh, a major investment, um, you could probably achieve it for a lot less than some of the duelling schemes and the road schemes and the rail schemes that we would really like to see. But if you want, if you want the highest priority, it's information. Okay. Uh, so how much would that cost? Would you reckon? How much would it cost? Oh. <laughs> well, uh, I think I think government's got more more experience in developing IT platforms than I. Um, <laughs> and I would ask you the question: How how much do you think that would cost? Okay. But I would well, suggest it would be a lot cheaper than dueling the A1. Um, all the way down to the north of England. Well, uh, would, it give me a, would it give me an answer to the question of whether or not Scotland should have a deep uh, sea port and do away with all this uh, road haulage south to the English deep sea ports? It wouldn't do away with the need for other infrastructure investment. Um, it would assist and facilitate 
multimodal shift. Would they, give me an answer? Of, would they give me an answer to that question? No, I wouldn't, wouldn't give you an answer to that question. <laughs> and, and I would suggest also that in terms of a deep sea port, um, as you're all aware, um, uh, Babcocks have proposals for a deep sea port on the fourth estuary, um, which would be a container port that would be open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year in terms of tidal access to it. Um, it has been a difficult process for them to get to where they are today, but I'm, I'm sure that they will achieve that um, deep sea port on the 4th um, in due course. And, it's, and it has been featured in the past in, in NPF3 documents and supported in NPF3. So I wouldn't take away from the need for a deep sea port for Scotland. Um, but in the meantime, let's get better information. Quick, quick run round the panel on that one. Highest yeah. priority. Highest priority for us, I would say, is that the model change to rail to invest in that to make sure that it's accessible more of the time and you know be able to take the weight and have reliability. But as far as deep sea ports are concerned, I have got to mention this when I get the chance. The whole opportunity for Scarpa Flow is there if there's a shift in the northeast and northwest passages if they become open to trade for more of the time. It's a huge opportunity for Scotland. If we don't grasp it, it'll go to Norway or the Faroes or somewhere else, and that'll be one of the biggest modal shifts. That's when you come into a major project for Marco Polo and for 10T for government support. That's a complete game changer, and it's not pinch and trade from someone else. It's actually changing the whole European dynamic, and we need to be prepared for that, and we can do it in clever ways too by having floating stuff we don't have to dredge we don't have to build there's unique ways of doing that we've got to keep our minds open to that because that would completely turn them up on its head okay. in terms of well okay um i take your points on these but in terms of heard evidence from several witnesses that we need an overhaul of a uh, freight policy, Scottish Government freight policy, and you'd mentioned earlier about the the pattern of ownership in our ports in particular ha have uh, given us problems, shall we say, no more than that. Um, <coughs> where do you think uh, freight policy uh, initiatives could, could bring us uh, benefit? I'm tempted to say um, we're not short of policies. Uh, I, think, I think there are lots of policies out there, national, regional, local, um, supportive of freight, supportive of various different aspects of transport. What, in my view, we need is actually a mechanism to implement it. Um, and we need, if that is a policy, if you class that as a policy issue, then fine. That's, that's what we need, is a mechanism to implement it. And I, I mentioned before the need for a neutral platform where freight operators can collaborate without the Office of Fair Trading, or whatever they're now called, um, uh, accusing them of setting up a cartel, um, where they can openly exchange information, particularly on environmental improvements to uh, freight logistics. Um, we need to have that. We need to do that because at the moment, um, one individual operator cannot uh, uh, achieve everything um, that, that we would all, I think, collectively want to achieve in terms of, of freight logistics. It needs to be a collaborative approach and it needs to be a collaborative approach which does not undermine natural competition. How you achieve it is, is not easy uh, uh, but there are examples of it having been achieved elsewhere in Europe um, through different mechanisms. Um, so if you call that policy, yes, that's where I think we need a, a major policy review. If you call that implementation, that's where I think we need a, a, an implementation uh, review. And, and one of our, our, our freight operators, the big, one of the big retailers who, as you know, operate their own freight systems, came out with a lovely word uh, of, of co-opetition. Um, and, and it was a deliberate choice of a, of a new word that you would like to see in the marketplace. Let's try and achieve a situation where we get co-opetition. In other words, they can cooperate freely and openly, but they can still, co still compete 
one with the other in terms of their, their own businesses. So um, okay. that's... Thanks. That, that would call for presumably Transport Scotland or the Scottish Government actually initiating that kind of uh, approach. I presume that's what you're, you're looking for. It, it would certainly call for them supporting such an approach. Yeah. Um, certainly in, in Sestran we're looking to try and achieve that through the fourth gateway initiatives that we're trying to get European funding for and so on. But we would look to Scottish Government support. It, would, it could not work without Scottish Government support. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having to, to rush on here given the, our time constraints. Um, the last question I have is with regards to the planning system. Um, do you see it currently working effectively um, in terms of uh, promoting the, uh, the freight sector in Scotland? So maybe Mr Cairns, you haven't spoken yet. Uh, that's a difficult point. It's Lots of the planning system is very active. It's responding to uh, to developers' proposals. Um, I think there's certainly a case for if you're trying to promote rail, looking at uh, a national rail terminal policy, because uh, clearly within our region there's no rail terminals at all. In central Scotland, um, it's perhaps not the best answer, for example, Grange Mouth has three separate terminals. Uh, if you're starting from scratch to produce an effective um, terminal, you, you'd work with one, which would be open to various customers. So I think there is a role for the planning system. But I, I think the difficulty with freight is that it is so market-driven. You can only create the conditions, uh, but it's really got to depend on developers coming forward with proposals. Anyone else? I think, think. NPF3 is a step in the right direction, as was NPF1 and NPF2. Um, and I think the inclusion in NPF3 of um, uh, initiatives to get better rail connectivity to the ports is, is very welcome. But as Mike says, um, what, what is missing from that is, is initiatives for better connectivity by rail. Um, overland by rail, not necessarily the last uh, 50 or 100 miles connections uh, to the ports. Um, so when you look at the rest of the UK, I think Scotland is in its planning context in that it has a national planning framework, it's got a national transport strategy, it's got NPF3. Our colleagues south of the border would envy that, to be honest, but it could be better. And, and as Mike says, in terms of development management, when you get down to the the detailed nitty-gritty of managing uh, applications, um, they tend to address local issues. Um, there is an initiative uh, ongoing at the moment within Sestran that came out of um, the regional um, um, planning strategy uh, for cross-boundary, analysis of the cross-boundary transport initiatives. And tra Transport Scotland, to, to their credit, are taking a lead on that. We're all cooperating with them. Uh, to do that. Um, and that really is a recognition of the fact that the development management and indeed the local planning system tends to deal with local issues. Um, and there is a need to look beyond local issues to, and, and beyond regional boundaries um, and indeed to look beyond Scottish boundaries. And, and I think that the, the NPF3 is a step in the right direction and it is an evolving process and, and hopefully NPF4 will be addressing the areas that are missing in NPF3. Thank you. David, you have the final question. Uh, thank you. Dear, um, could each of the panel members give the, the committee one example of best practice in Europe of freight infrastructure schemes which have perhaps used a mixture of, of private sector or public sector funding? And to perhaps answer my own questions, I tend to do. Uh, when we were in Rotterdam recently, they were uh, given the example of the dedicated freight rail line that they'd set up, which is a fantastic example, which is an enhancement for uh, the whole of Europe, of, of course, Rotterdam being Europe's uh, largest port. Can I start with Mr Matthews? Uh, yes, I, I think, I think there's a, the, the challenge is obviously, obviously the system here is, is different in, in a number of ways to that operating in, in uh, other parts of Europe. Um, I, th I think rather than point to any particular example, I'd just say that you know it's clear that other parts of Europe, um, some Central European countries, 
they, they get this much better than we do. The infrastructure is there. The, uh, the balanced appraisal of different options is there. The thinking across corridors, the thinking about integration is there. And so, so rather than focusing on I individual projects, I think, uh, going back to my earlier point about, say, how, how we look at in investment along, say, the A9 corridor, it's about that, that appraisal system and that way of judging costs and benefits and so on and taking into account wider economic, social and environmental appraisal. And I think once that investment flows, it's there. The other thing is just that simply the amount of investment in a lot of other European countries over a longer period of time has been there, and that's clearly beneficial to both uh, passenger rail and also uh, to, to, to freight travel as well. So would you say in sort of simplistic terms that we're more mid-table than winning the championship in terms of freight infrastructure? Uh, yes, I mean, I, you know, there's, there's, so there are clear pinch points here in Scotland. We have some antiquated infrastructure in terms of the, the rail freight terminals. We have uh, an awful lot of said, single track and inadequate infrastructure for, for rail north and south of the central belt in particular. So uh, <clears throat> I, I think it's, you know, I, I, I agree with other points. Things like information are very important. The, the way information technology has moved on, we can overcome a lot of the, the, the challenges around half, half full vehicles charging around emitting a lot of uh, emissions and costing a lot of economic things. But as with so many things, a lot of it does come down to investment in the infrastructure. The, the other point to make is that the, the money is there. We have a huge amount of money allocated for different transport projects. I think from our point of view, just we'd, we'd argue that the priorities are not necessarily the best priorities in terms of what we've chosen to spend that money on and the way, way we've chosen to spend it. Thanks. Um, um, I've, I've, I've probably got about half a dozen good examples, and I'll, I'll happily pass these on to Jason um, rather than take up the time of the committee today. But there is one example... Um, in, in Sweden, and excuse my pronunciation of it, Al Almhult um, in Sweden, which is a dry port, and it's not a big dry port. One of the things that we found when we did our analysis of dry ports that if you've got the huge populations and the big movements of freight, you can get the private sector in uh, to develop a dry port and it can work successfully. Where it's more difficult is if you're in the marginal, and you know, in Scotland in general tends to be. Uh, at lower volumes. This is one that's relatively low volumes. Um, it, uh, it's, it's in Sweden and it serves um, um, uh, the uh, ports of Malmo and Stockholm. And it was developed um, when IKEA pulled out of it, but it was developed in partnership with the municipality, uh, the local government, in terms of developing it. And that local um, um, municipality input has provided the sufficient public sector uh, 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 um, input in order for what probably was quite a marginal or, or, or a negative business case actually to flip over and become positive and start to achieve some of, of the environmental benefits in that region. But there are a number of them. There's a number of examples also of, of very good cooperation in the private sector, operators in, in, in Switzerland, in Germany, in, uh, uh, in Italy as well, where you have partnerships between the road, the road hauliers, the rail operators, and the freight forwarders in one company. Um, and the road hauliers still compete one with the other, the rail companies still compete one with the other, but the, the grouping brings it together in order to provide this neutral platform in order to, to, to improve it. And I'll, I'll happily pass these on to Jason. Very helpful. Mr Kearns? Yeah, absolutely. I was impressed by uh, the example of the Norwegian post office, um, initially working in Trondheim, but spreading throughout the rest of Norway. And they're going for largely emissions-free deliveries in city centres. And what they've actually done uh, in Trondheim, they've completely replaced all their diesel-powered vehicles uh, through a combination of electric-powered trolleys. So more deliveries, particularly of larger, bulkier parcels, could be made on foot. Um, instead of using vans. The, the vans that they have used have all been converted to full electric, and the larger vehicles uh, for the bulk loads are uh, using hybrid vehicles. Now, that they've done, it's, it's a government-owned organisation, but arm's length, uh, so similar to what the Royal Mail was about two years ago, say. Um, but it has required considerable amount of support to make the investment in electric vehicles. Uh, and they've had difficulties actually sourcing them uh, in Norway to too far away, for example, from Mercedes-Benz to supply. Um, so 
there are issues there, but certainly uh, looking at uh, Norwegian Post, they've gone a long way to reducing and, and in lots of cases eliminating carbon emissions and local air pollutants. Thank you for that. Mr McCree. I think James is going to... Well, I was just going to say, you, we, we, you've heard about lifting the Spirit project, but a spin-off from that that was really interesting was the fact that other uh, local food producers in the area were back hauling and using that and may continue to use that in the future. And, you know, you're just involving other groups. I think there's far more in these things than we could ever imagine. And that I thought was quite exciting that you do one thing and it brings other people on board as you collaborate and, and, and work with industry and you get something, you get another result you weren't expecting. But, but Neil, maybe has something more oh. to say. No, I, I think it comes back to just the wider questions about uh, planning policy as well in terms of how we apply EU directives and whether state aid or territorial cohesion is actually comes more at the forefront in terms of just a more proactive and not interventionist, but facilitating that cooperation, I think. And I think that's done a lot better in a lot of, well, some Scandinavian countries, but elsewhere in Europe too. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I thank all of our witnesses for their comprehensive evidence this morning? And can I thank you, Mr Macaulay, for the offer of additional supplementary written evidence on European uh, case studies? Uh, the committee will find that invaluable, I'm sure, uh, as it takes forward this important piece of work. Uh, thank you very much. I, I now suspend uh, this meeting briefly to allow for a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
second panel, uh, can I welcome from Network Rail Anne McKenzie, Senior Route Freight Manager, and Nigel Wunsch, Head of Strategy and Planning. Uh, good morning. Uh, if I could kick off, clearly Network Rail has a, a responsibility for investment and maintenance in the rail network. You're currently uh, working on a Scotland route study which will look at the upgrades and investments that are required for future growth, both on the network and economic growth. Can you provide the committee with an update on the work of the, of the study and how this is informing future planning for the rail network in Scotland, please? Yep, thank you very much, Kavina. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk to you this morning uh, and to help you with your, your inquiry. Uh, the route study, uh, which is the, the current part of the long-term planning process uh, that we're working through, is there to uh, look at what the industry needs to invest in over the next 30 years. So we're really looking at what where do we want to be in 30 years' time, in, the, in 2043, for the rail freight, uh, rail sector uh, across both freight and passenger business. So uh, the work we're currently doing has been looking at uh, what the demand is likely to be in, in, in that sort of timescale, um, and, and based on that demand, what train service would be required to deliver that, and inevitably that will be a significant growth in both the passenger and freight uh, business, uh, both the number of passengers, the volume of freight, uh, and the, the distances they're travelling is expected to grow. Uh, based on that, we then need to look at where, where the pinch points are, where the, 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 the gaps will be in the in infrastructure uh, and how we would best fill those gaps, what are the opportunities to, to do that uh, over the next, uh, and what would, do we want the uh, network to look like uh, by 2043. And we then work back from there to say, OK, if that's what we want to get to in 2043, what are the steps we need to take between now and then uh, to, to deliver that. The uh, route study is scheduled to deliver uh, a draft for consultation uh, by the end of this year, uh, end of 2015. Uh, that will then go out for wide consultation uh, and certainly based on previous experience elsewhere in, in, in Great Britain, there will be lots of views and comments. Um, based on those, we'll then produce the final uh, route study, which will be uh, published in uh, the middle of 2016. Um, that's a regulated document. The Office of Rail Regulation need to uh, approve it. Um, and that also feeds into our initial industry plan for the next uh, five-year control period, starting from 2019, uh, which, which is what we'll be bidding to the Scottish Government uh, to, to invest in our recommendations, what should be the investment for the next five years. Ms McKenzie, have you got anything to add? No, I haven't got anything. Okay, and uh, I don't know if you had an opportunity to hear the, the previous evidence session, but we heard evidence from a number of uh, witnesses um, that the investment priority uh, should be in the modal shift uh, from uh, road to rail freight. Uh, is that something that you envisage being looked at as part of the study? Oh, absolutely. Um, we, we, you know, we, we believe very strongly that there are many flows for which rail is uh, ideally suited. Um, particularly uh, larger, uh, longer distance flows and bulk flows, uh, where freight is the ideal, uh, rail is the ideal way to transport those sort of traffics. Um, and we anticipate investing both in the ability to run longer trains on the network uh, and uh, investing in uh, improvements in gauge to allow, uh, particularly on the, the Anglo-Scottish flows, um, bigger, conta bigger containers to be operated on standard uh, rail wagons. Mm -hmm. so, you know, clearly, you don't want to preempt the the outcome of, of the study, but there's a number of issues that are emerging, th uh, both through this inquiry uh, and the evidence we've received, um, and the you know, wider uh, debate and discussion around uh, rail freight in Scotland. And uh, one of those is the one that you've alluded to in terms of um, improvements to uh, capacity, but also you'll be. We've heard from the the rail freight group about the, the lack of long overtaking loops. Uh, the fact that so much of the network remains single track, the, the ad inadequate uh, length of crossing loops and, and so on. Are, are these issues that are, are moving up your agenda? Yes, uh, inevitably. Uh, the, the, they're all, you know, longer, the longer we can operate freight trains where the demand's there, uh, the, the more efficient it is and the better use of capacity. Um, short trains are, are not a good use of, of 
the limited capacity in the rail network. So the ability to operate longer trains is, is definitely uh, a benefit. Uh, we've recently done quite a lot of work, for example, in the West Highland Line, where we now run uh, trains that are actually longer than the loops with special arrangements, um, so that when they pass, uh, they pass passenger trains while they're in the loop and allow the freight, longer freight trains to operate, um, which has improved the viability of those trains for the freight operators. However, you have to say that it's only, we can only run uh, longer trains where the demand's there, uh, and on some routes there isn't the demand for, for that volume of traffic uh, that needs the longer trains. But, but yes, there are lots of routes on which uh, West Coast Main Line, East Coast Main Line, we would like to see longer, route, longer loops, because uh, it would make the operation of those uh, more flexible um, and allow uh, longer, we, we similarly operate long freight trains on the West Coast Main Line from coming up from England uh, via Carlisle to Glasgow or to Moss End in, in the Glasgow area. Um, and they also are longer than a lot of the loops um, and, and again, have to be carefully managed to avoid delaying other services. So is, is it fair to say, therefore, that through the study uh, and, and the, the bids that you'll be making for investment from government, that you'll be seeking to address the significant infrastructure, capacity, issues and pinch points that exist on the network? Yeah, I think um, in, inevitably the East Coast Main Line uh, will be high up the list of priorities. It, we, the, the, there are starting to be definite capacity pinch points for both passenger and freight uh, between uh, Berwick and Edinburgh uh, and even down as far as Newcastle, which is obviously out with the Scotland, Scottish Government's remit, but, but, but that's really the, the, the section of route that's relevant. Um, but also going north of the Central Belt towards Inverness and towards Aberdeen, um, where we're currently investing uh, as part of this control period in improvements to uh, the, the Highland Main Line between Perth and Inverness, aimed at both reducing journey time for passenger trains, increasing capacity for passenger and increasing capacity for freight. So some of that will, will almost certainly include uh, longer loops or longer sections of double track. Okay. Uh, one of the issues that's been highlighted by David Spaven of the Rail Freight Group was the Channel Tunnel and the potential as yet unrealised and unfulfilled uh, for that, that route to fulfil um, our freight requirements in terms of moving freight by, by rail. Uh, there was a suggestion that that hasn't happened and is unlikely to do so without proactive support to pump prime uh, an initiative for a Scotland to the you know, European mainland freight train. Do you have a view on that? I, I think pro, I'll, I'll let maybe let Anne come in on this one because I think that's probably something that, that uh, Anne's maybe better placed to, to answer. But um, I, I think... Yes, inevitably, if, if you could encourage greater use of uh, freight through the Channel Tunnel, there would be more freight, you know, you could get more freight on rail. I think you have to think carefully about where you're trying to get that freight to, uh, and remember also that the uh, freight market is a commercial market, uh, and there are risks if you start uh, uh, affecting that market that we get into uh, competition issues and state aid issues. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, yeah, I agree with Nigel. Um, I do agree with David Spaven as well, though, that um, sometimes pump priming would be ideal for a brand new service. It does take critical mass to actually get a new train <laughs> up and running. Um, and sometimes when there is low volumes to start off with, it doesn't quite justify a train. But if you pump prime a train to start off with, um, the volume could then follow. There is potentially volume to have a train direct from Scotland to Europe via the Channel Tunnel, it's coming back, that's the issue. Um, you probably have to go via one of the um, English terminals in order to get the volume to come back up to Scotland at this time. OK, thank you. I've got a final question as an Edinburgh MSP, and that is in relation to improvements that are already underway uh, in, in the network, and one of those is the electrification of the Edinburgh South suburban line. Uh, is there some, anything that you can, can say that would be of interest to, to people in Edinburgh? Um, certainly we believe that electrification of the Edinburgh South Suburban Line would be a benefit to freight. Um, it would allow, uh, it would ensure that electric, uh, that freight traffic can be electric hauled via the East Coast Main Line uh, and across the Central Belt. Um, at the moment, quite a lot of that traffic has to be diesel hauled because there isn't the capacity through Edinburgh Waverley, which is the only electrified route uh, for that sort of traffic to operate. Uh, Edinburgh Waverley is full with passenger traffic uh, and really we want to avoid freight 
passing through there. If we electrify the Edinburgh Suburban Line, we would then be able to divert uh, and operate more electric freight, which is more efficient, longer trains, uh, better college capacity and generally better acceleration. Um, in terms of, we, we proposed that as part of our um, initial industry plan for CP5. Uh, it wasn't included in the Scottish Government's priorities for CP5, uh, but we are continuing to work with the Scottish Government um, uh, and Transport Scotland uh, and anticipate it will be part of the uh, priorities for the next control period. Okay, and is that fully uh, costed as a, as a proposal? We are continuing to do the development work on that uh, to get a final uh, current price for it that we will include in our initial industry plan again for CP6 for the next control period. All right, thank you. Uh, Dave has a short thank supplementary. You. Thank you. Very short uh, point. I'm very enthusiastic about electrification, not, not least uh, to the Highlands, and, um, which I think would be vitally important. Certainly talking to the industry, they obviously uh, are very keen on electrification, not least because it also matches the issue about climate change targets. I, you heard my question, I think, earlier about that point, that we tend to put transport in a different uh, view. We should be taking an integrated approach and saying, we believe in climate change in any policy we have, therefore electrification makes a lot of sense. Also, you, you touched the point I was going to make, it's much better for acceleration, also much better for maintenance. I've had several examples where we've had train breakdowns in bad weather, say at uh, Dramocta, for example, there's less, that's less likely to happen where you've, where you've got um, electrification in terms of efficiency and reduced costs on maintenance. Would you agree? Uh, oh, with all except the last point about electrification over Dromochter, because I have some concerns about the um, making sure that the over actual electrification is robust in the sort of climate we get up there. It's very exposed um, and very uh, in the winter. Um, in many ways, actually, electric uh, overhead line electrification can be quite vulnerable. But with the exception of that, I would agree with the points you make. Um, I do very strongly support that we should be electrifying. Um, on, in terms of the climate change comment you made, I think the thing I would be keen to see is that transport is looked at as a whole, uh, network rail uh, and the rail industry has targets imposed upon us to reduce ca our carbon emissions. Uh, and actually, to me, the most efficient way of reducing carbon emissions for the country would be to move more traffic onto rail. But that would actually increase our carbon emissions because we'd be running more trains uh, and or the, or the operates running more trains and we have to invest in more infrastructure which uh, creates more carbon embedded carbon as we build new bits of railway off, though, isn't it? it's a one-off but but it does affect our targets and, and the way we are targeted is about reducing our, our carbon emissions and while i'm fully in, in support of improving the efficiency in a carbon sense of how we operate the railway uh, nevertheless uh, the more traffic we haul uh, the greater our carbon. Okay, thank you. Adam. Yes, can I ask uh, what changes in demand for uh, rail freight are anticipated over the next few years? Um, we know, for example, with the announcement regarding Longanet, uh, that coal trains will be, uh, there'll be a lot less coal trains, presumably. Um, uh, starting next year, <clears throat> and what action do you need to take uh, to ensure that the, the Scottish Rail Network hopefully will, will be meeting more demand in other areas uh, in the future? How are, you going to, how are you going to anticipate that and how are you going to deal with it? I think you're, you're quite right. As, as I said earlier on, we anticipate significant growth in other uh, sectors of the market, uh, coal, um, we're not quite sure of the future at the moment with the, with the changes in uh, Long Island. That's all relatively recent news, and we're still trying to un get, get our minds around the changes that will bring uh, to, to, to the coal flows across Scotland. Um, in terms of other markets, uh, we anticipate intermodal market, both domestic and international, growing significantly. Um, we, we see a kind of over the next... 10 to 15 years, uh, I would anticipate sort of a, a, a 50 or 60 percent growth in that. The industry is capable of, of handling that. We need to invest in certain particular locations, and we talked a bit about that earlier on when I was speaking about the route study. Um, and I, I would anticipate that that will, is looking very much at what does the market need 
in the next 30 years and how do we get there uh, and certainly the uh, um, market study that was done on the freight as the uh, requirements as part of that uh, route study process across the country uh, showed significant growth across a number of the sectors. If you want to add anything to that. Um, I, suppose, I mean, the coal traffic forms about 62% of all the product we move on rail in Scotland. But over the next 30 years, um, as Nigel mentioned, intermodal traffic is meant to grow, is forecast to grow significantly. Um, and I think by 2043, the forecast would would give us still give us some growth, even though we've, the coal has um, potentially by that time um, disappeared. Yes, forgive me, about this 2043 date, I think most of us around this table will be dead by then, so <laughs> I'm more looking at... <laughs> <laughs> uh, the immediate future is obviously something that where the next 10 to 15 years is, is uh, what we've got a particular focus on. Um, and clearly we've heard today, this morning, from the regional transport partnerships that they're looking for a significant shift from road to intermodal, shift from road to rail haulage. So, I mean, what are your plans or how do you anticipate that, that moving forward? I think the, the significance of the 30-year horizon is that, that uh, rail infrastructure is a long-life infrastructure uh, and we're investing in, uh, in uh, rail infrastructure. We need to think about the cycle of renewals that we, have, that we go through. Uh, so, so track and structures and signalling all last uh, in the kind of 15 plus year, uh, and in fact, some of the um, bridges are probably in the 120 year cycle. So, so we need to be having that long term look. But you're quite right. We want to get freight onto rail and growing uh, much in a much shorter time scales than that. And that, as I explained earlier on, is, is part of the whole route study process that we look at the long term and then draw back from there and say, OK, based on that, what do we need to do in the next uh, five to ten years? So currently we're investing in in the current control period in loading gauge improvements to allow bigger containers uh, from the East Coast main line uh, across the central belt uh, into towards Moss End, which is the main and, and Coat Bridge area, which is the main freight hub and up towards Grangemouth. Um, Going north from there, we're, we're looking at how we can get bigger containers uh, going further north uh, towards Aberdeen and Inverness. Uh, and inevitably, given the major infrastructure constraints and the number of tunnels and significant bridges, Fourth Bridge, for example, where, where we can't really cut bits out of the, uh, the, the cross girders because it doesn't really do it any good, um, we need to look at how do we get uh, containers, bigger containers, across without doing that sort of and that's about how can we invest as an industry in uh, lower platform wagons uh, now lower platform wagons are quite expensive to, to build and slightly more expensive to operate but are probably still a cheaper way of coping with the volumes of traffic that are likely to be going uh, across the, the scotland north of the central belt um the, the but the current um industry structure and government structure in terms of uh, grants that are available uh, as more about fixed infrastructure and not about investing uh, in rolling stock to, to meet that need. So would you like to see a shift in emphasis away from fixed in infrastructure to a more kind of operational type of support? Or, or looking at both. Both, yeah. Both. Okay. okay yeah. It's a balance. We need a balance between the two. Okay. Um, can I ask... Um, uh, on a different subject, what impact do you anticipate from HS2 on the free flow of rail freight uh, from Scotland, to and from Scotland? Yeah. I think the key thing about HS2 is, is it's targeted at relieving congestion on the, the, the routes out of London. Uh, the routes out of London are already significantly congested um, and from a Scottish perspective, if we can't get down to the, the London area and across London towards the Channel Tunnel and towards the major ports of Felixstowe and Southampton, um, then we're, we're more isolated. So the, the advantage of HS2 taking a, a significant amounts of passenger traffic off the West Coast Main Line at the southern end, south of, south of Preston, uh, frees up capacity on that route for local passenger journeys and for greater rail freight. 
and if we can get greater rail freight on those congested bits of the infrastructure, uh, then they uh, then they can come further north uh, into to the north of England and Scotland. To do that, we also need to invest in, in improvements to the infrastructure on what we might call the classic railway uh, north of Preston, where in this current in the shorter term, and that's probably up to 2043, uh, it's unlikely that HS2 will, will get as far north as that. Um, to do that, we're looking at longer loops on the West Coast Main Line and potentially, over the next 10 years, um, some uh, freight bypasses that allow some short sections of, of, of new um, route that allow passenger and freight to be separated uh, up the up, particularly up the steeper hills uh, of Betick and Shap um, uh, and allow passenger trains to overtake slower running freight trains. Okay, well maybe the outcome of the general election might advance that a little bit, but we'll wait and see. Okay, thank you Adam. I'm confident that um, all of us around the table will live long enough to see the, the conclusion of this inquiry. Mary, you have some questions. Yes, um, thank you. We've heard an evidence about the um, the need for additional capacity on the East Coast Main Line, and we've talked about a number of these issues this morning already, about longer passing loops, double tracking. You talked yourself about freight bypasses, improvements to the West Highland Line. Are there any other specific parts of the Scottish Rail Network that limit the expansion of rail freight? Um, and if you can identify them, how can they be improved, and where are they on your list of priorities? There's a lot of questions there in one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can work my way through them. Um, just keep, keeps the brain going. Um, okay, so there are a lot. We've, you're right. We've covered a, a number of the highest priority places in the conversations we've had already. Are there limitations on the network? Of course, there are limitations on the network. The the balance. The, the challenge for us is to balance where the demand is going to come from. Uh, and where we therefore get best uh, value for money out of that investment. So the routes we've talked about, so West, Main, West Coast Main Line up and East Coast Main Line connecting us with England, um, and onwards to Aberdeen and Inverness uh, and, and Grangemouth as the kind of key freight, some of the key freight hubs, um, are the critical points where we want to see where we think the investment will get the biggest return. If the demand is there then going beyond that up into the West Highland Line uh, or up into the Far North Line, um, th th one could spend significant sums of money to improve those routes. Um, but it's very difficult to see to get that balance because when the demand into these areas is much lighter. So we do run freight traffic on both the Far North Line and on the West Highland Line in terms of the demand that's there today. We're not aware of uh, that demand being frustrated by lack of capacity um, at, the, at this stage, uh, and in the, hopefully the, the, the route study will help to identify where, the, where that might be a problem in the longer term. But I, I suppose part of the problem is if you Im improve the network and you do the work, the traffic will come. Freight's not using rail because they can't, so they use alternative means of, of moving freight but it is a bit like you build the house, the people will come. You improve the network, the freight will follow. Well, I wish that were true. Um, unfortunately, we've got a number of examples where we have improved the network and the traffic hasn't come, uh, despite the, the predictions and the, 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 the um, forecasts and the appraisals that were done. So, without naming... Well, yeah, I'm going to name names. Um, Race Farm in Dice, just north of Aberdeen, was a big investment which we did with uh, partners in an improved freight facility in the Aberdeen area. Now, people can now, with hindsight, looking back, say, oh, but it's in the wrong place. That was where we were encouraged to put it, um, and that was where people wanted the freight facility at that time. The volume of traffic going through Race Farm is very low. So uh, there are other examples that we could quote where we've been encouraged to invest um, gauge clearance to Elgin. Um, a good thing to do, uh, and we'd love to see container traffic going up there. There is capacity on the network for it to, to operate very small volumes, lifting the spirit being the only example that, that has used it. And much as a success that was, it, it, it hasn't been followed up with, a, with commercially viable traffic following on from it. OK, thank you. And is there anything else you want to add? I think Nigel has covered it quite quickly. <laughs> OK. Oh, one, sorry. Um, one thing we have heard in our evidence sessions is the priority that's given to freight. 
Um, and, and concerns have been raised that freight has to wait for passenger trains to, to, to move through. The, the longer passing loops is obviously a, a, a problem um, there as well. Um, but what have, evidence have you received about the, the desire to give freight a higher priority? And how can you broaden the, the movement and the times that freight is allowed to move, particularly at the weekend, because freight can't move over a Saturday night into a Sunday? Okay. Um, I don't think I would go as far as to say it, we, we give priority to, to passenger over freight in, in the way that you describe. In timetabling terms, we have to reach a balanced timetable of all the operators. Uh, there's obviously great pressure on the rail network to reduce journey time for passenger trains. Um, the, the, the best way to run a railway is if all the trains run at the same average speed. So if the freight trains were able to go at the same average speed as, freight, as passenger trains, then they all just trundle along together. But in much the same way as a dual carriageway helps or, or helps over a single carriageway for our road vehicles so that lighter weight and faster cars can overtake lorries, uh, having more loops allows passenger trains to overtake freight. However, we develop timetables which allow to get that balance and get the journey time that the freight customers desire or as close as possible to the journey time they desire, um, but still allow the passenger trains to operate. And where we haven't got that capacity, we do look at opportunities to invest in more capacity to allow that. In terms of when traffic can run uh, and, and restrictions or otherwise, yes, we have a need also to find time to maintain the network. Uh, we try and do that at the times when the network is least in demand um, because um, and we are a very safety conscious industry. We do our very best to, to manage and keep, passenger, keep trains and people apart. Trains and people on the network together is not a good thing and therefore to maintain the network uh, we, we are much more safety conscious I believe than the road network for example. We don't have people wandering about putting cones out uh, and, and wandering across motorways as, as the way they do wandering across motorways putting out uh, signs. Um, we do have to restrict the, the passage of trains while we do that maintenance work. Um, so from most routes, from a passenger perspective, the quietest time is a Saturday night into Sunday, uh, and that's the time we do uh, that maintenance uh, of, the, of the network. But over much of the network, where, where there is a demand for freight traffic, we have looked uh, to, to balance that, and we do uh, focus uh, the, the um, maintenance opportunities in as short a spell as possible. So uh, uh, talked about the Hunterston Long Annet route, which runs on, on very much a, a, a 24 hour a day, six and a half day a week. Um, and we focus the, the maintenance on those sections of the network into very short spells. But we need to find some time to do it. So has any study been done on the impact of, on freight, on the restrictions, that particularly on a Saturday night? Uh, not specifically, I don't think. Um, we're not uh, aware of uh, one of the issues. I, I think we really need to talk to the freight operators more than us about, but I believe that one of the issues for the freight operators is that when we are doing the major maintenance works on a Saturday night, we also require freight uh, trains to support that uh, with conveying rails and ballast and so on to the sites where we're working. Uh, and many of the freight operators are involved in that. So they've got to balance their resources as well to, to find those resources to, to, to do that. Uh, yes, I'm sure that from the supermarket's point of view, they do want seven-day weeks, 24-hour-a-day movement, uh, and roads no doubt have that benefit uh, in that they, there is, tends to be ways around it, and when the roads are quiet, you can close bits of the network and, and allow... Um, maintenance to happen and still find bypasses that, that get you around that um, and, and we have some examples of that but the it is expensive to have that capacity uh, to, to deliver that so you can run uh, uh, traffic during maintenance periods Thank you Thank you Mary, Michael Thank you um, you, you, you mentioned uh, previously, or there's been some discussion about um, loading age restrictions, but I wonder if you could just be a bit more specific in terms of, you know, in a strategic sense, are there particular pinch points that you would prioritise in trying to deal with, um, and are there perhaps innovative solutions that might tackle these, other than just, you know, low wagons obviously make sense, but are there perhaps some other 
uh, solutions? Yep, um, we've we've obviously done quite a lot of work uh, in terms of gradually improving the, the gauge for, for container traffic. Um, both the West Coast Main Line and the East Coast Main Line um, are cleared for um, most containers. Uh, and we are rec we have recently, um, for example, demolished the tunnel at Carmures, wh which is one step along the way uh, to, to improving the gauge facility to Grangemouth. Um, where else would we go? It would be nice, as I said earlier on, to go north to Aberdeen and to Inverness, but there are a number of structures that would be very difficult to clear to the full gauge. Um, we do things like lowering track as well as raising bridges, um, but all of these things have a cost. Uh, lowering track uh, increases longer term costs because mean you then create a dip in the uh, which, which tends to create maintenance costs longer term because water gathers and, and drainage becomes more of a challenge. Um, so we've done lot, we've, we have tried various ways of delivering that, um, but it is also around the volumes of traffic that you're trying to move uh, that, that you need that critical mass that Anne referred to uh, in order to justify the investment of significant sums of money. As electrification comes along, one of the things we have to do for electrification uh, is often build new bridges. So as we build new bridges, uh, we generally will build them for higher gauges, uh, not just for electrification, but for bigger containers. So over the next few years, for example, the Shots route uh, between uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow via Shots, the, the gap, in, if you like, in that will be electrified. And as part of doing that, we're starting to raise structures um, um, which is giving us will, will in due course give us clearance for bigger containers over that route. But again, we are competing uh, with the road network because in building raising bridges uh, and, and building new bridges has a disruptive effect on the roads network. So we have to work very closely with the local authorities to minimise that that disruption, uh, because from their point of view, uh, the the local disruption to the roads network is often uh, more disbenefit than the benefits they see from the bigger. Uh, bridges from the real perspective. Thank you. And, and you've kind of half anticipated my next question, which is about electrification. And I just wonder um, where you feel the priorities are for for uh, more more electrification. And uh, I mean, the benefits I think are fairly obvious. But uh, wh where do you see the priority areas? Where is it most likely to happen next? Okay. The current. Um Funding takes us, f fills in Glasgow and Edinburgh, uh, as you know, via Egypt, um, including up to Stirling, Dublin and Alloa, um, which will uh, get us to the point where most of the traffic in the central Scotland is electric hauled. Uh, and as I say, we, we also are uh, funded to complete sh the shots line uh, by 2019. We're currently in discussions with Transport Scotland about priorities beyond that. Um, we anticipate, uh, for example, that the remaining uh, suburban Glasgow suburban network would probably be the next place we'd like to infill. There are one or two routes like East Kilbride and Barhead, not of great benefit to freight, but definitely a benefit to, to passenger services. Going beyond that, the discussion is about how we go north uh, from Glasgow and Edinburgh towards, uh, eventually towards Aberdeen and Inverness. Uh, the challenge we're currently in discussion, uh, let's say internally with the industry and with the Transport Scotland is about what order we do that because really until you complete that it, it whole section Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Inverness and, uh, which includes all the Fife includes the bridges across Forth and Tay includes a significant number of tunnels and includes the, the, the exposed route I was mentioning earlier on across the passes going up to Inverness until you complete all of that there will, you, you don't really get all the benefits because you will always have some bits of the network where you're running under diesel trains under the wires, unless you get to the bi-mode situation, and we know that uh, at least one of the freight operators is currently investing in bi-mode locals, which will allow um, trains to be hauled electrically when they're under the wires, and diesel uh, when, when they get off the electrified bits of the network. So, so there's benefits there. We've also, as Network Rail, been working very closely with the industry on uh, looking at uh, independently powered electric trains, so um, battery operated. We've done uh, some experimental work in England uh, and run uh, successfully in passenger traffic on the Harwich branch, an independently powered yeah, uh, electric unit, which allows you to go uh, up to 50 kilometres off the um, 
the, the electrified network and is ideal for short branches uh, which currently don't have uh, overhead lines but can where the train can run mostly um, under the wires and then go onto them. So we're looking at lots of different options. Um, we've some of the electrification we've done in Scotland recently has some innovative ideas or under some of the bridges where we've not had to raise the bridges but by uh, having short sections where, where the wires don't actually carry any electric power um, and that's a benefit and reduces the costs. But conversely, there are cost pressures the other way in safety terms. For example, we're now required to, to electrify lines to raise parapet heights and bridges to very high uh, to, to improve safety and to stop people being able to, to throw things over. Um, there's a significant cost associated with that, which increases the costs of electrification. That's very interesting. Uh, just, just briefly, you mentioned that the progress northwards will be in the longer term. Could you give us an idea of time scale? Are any of us around the table up, up to see this, or, or is it beyond our lifespans? I don't. Oh, I wouldn't have thought it's beyond our lifespans. Um, that that depends on how much, you know, how quickly the, the, the government wants to specify doing it. The current uh, control period asks us to electrify about a hundred kilometer, hundred track kilometers a year. Um, if you take that forward, uh, I, I believe you would complete to Aberdeen and Inverness by around 2030. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Do we need uh, to refresh the Scottish Government freight policy? I think all of these, all policies need reviewed on a rolling basis. I, I'm, I'm not a great believer in in sort of big bang, right, we're going to do that now and then we'll leave it for the next 10 years. I think these are the sort of things that you need to keep reviewing uh, as, as circumstances change. Um, uh, I'm sure there are things in the, the government, Scottish Government freight policy, I know that Transport Scotland are reviewing their freight policy, uh, their, their freight pro policy at the moment, um, along with other things that they're, they're reviewing. Um, in terms of whether there are specifics, I'm not sure about whether I, Anne, you want to comment on that. Um. I can't actually remember when the real freight policy was that update last issued. To um, I think that was 2006 was the last formal issue of it. I believe, as I say, they're currently re refreshing it at the moment and anticipate it will be published in the next six to 12 months as a refreshed document. But it, it, you know, these things are change relatively slowly. Um, I, I, but as I say, my, my preference is not to have a, a big bang refreshes, but gradually, you, as things crop up, that you, you change them. It's a wide question, but do you believe that our current um, planning policies and our planning systems are efficient and effective as far as real is concerned? Um, I, I think it was quite disappointing that the MPS3 didn't actually contain any projects for rail freight. Um, it mentioned the strategic importance of Grangemouth, Coatbridge and Moss End, but there wasn't any specific projects in there to actually um, take strategy forward. Um, so that's potentially a missed opportunity for rail freight. Let's hope MPF4 actually does um, look more into rail freight. I think going beyond that, the, the, the planning world needs to think about the impact of, of uh, freight uh, of rail uh, beyond the, the rail network. I think we, there's, there's a number of examples where um, planning has allowed um, housing, for example, close to rail, um, where people then build their houses and then complain that their house is next to a railway and it makes noise. Uh, and that's also an issue for, for when people are talking about greater nighttime traffic. Um, is that unfortunately um, people want you know most people feel that they want you know they want it quiet at night if you live next to a railway that's running 24 hours a day or, or even 18 hours a day then there will be noise during the night from the trains passing um, and, and that's something that the planning net framework needs to take account of I believe that in, in the parallel with road we've heard lots of good examples of um, where there could be nighttime deliveries um, that's the point Mary Fee and I were discussing. Yeah. If you happen to live in an estate in Glasgow and you're next to a large warehouse that's now having 24 hour delivery, you're not going to be very happy. And so, integrated planning is clearly important. Um, in the last session, you deferred the question asked about best practice uh, in Europe. Um, could you uh, identify a best practice of where 
Um, you saw uh, rail infrastructure being top of the tree, a, a fantastic example that we should be monitoring. And just to refresh you, the best practice I was identifying was uh, um, Rotterdam Harbour, which developed its own dedicated freight rail line. And the example I'd, I'd, I said at a previous session, but not today, was they were mentioning that boats that are sailing past Italy for goods to Italy don't stop in Italy. They go right round to go into Rotterdam and then they use the dedicated rail uh, freight service to get to Italy, which was a fantastic example of how they've developed that. Um, what's your views on that particular project and can you identify any other best practice that the committee could uh, identify? I'm not entirely familiar with the exact detail of the Rotterdam example. Um, I think the biggest issue for, for Rotterdam is that they have huge volumes of container traffic. Um, nowhere in Britain has that volume of traffic demand. Um, the, uh, as I understand it, the, 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 the deep sea shipping lines want to call at as few ports as possible and unload as many containers as possible at those locations. So they want to do the long haul and get rid of all the containers in one place and then use short sea shipping or rail to deliver. So from a British point of view, the, the only ports they come into is Southampton and Felixstowe, but in many ways they would rather just go to Rotterdam, um, unload in Rotterdam and then use short sea shipping um, to get to the ports around the coast of Britain. So Grangemouth, for example, does quite well out of that sort of traffic. Um, but equally, that draws away from uh, the, the, the rail perspective, because if the ships were using Felixstowe or Southampton, they would then come by rail, uh, the containers would then generally come by rail from those ports to Scotland. So, so there's a balance. And maybe overall for the economy of the country and the carbon emissions and so on, the ship option is overall better. Uh, that's not for me to comment on, but there's a balance there. In terms of building bits of network specifically for freight, I mean, we obviously have a number of uh, freight branches uh, which are dedicated to freight traffic. Uh, so Grangemouth is probably a good example where we do go to the port. Um, there's very little traffic that comes from the port. We take quite a lot of traffic into Grangemouth uh, from the south, from uh, bulk um, consolidation points in the south of England that come up to Grangemouth uh, and then get distributed from there. Um, but we, I, I, I think the, the issue for in terms of um, learning from Europe is I think much of the, the British market is so different in terms of both the volume and the distances that that freight traffic can go within Britain that we are probably, there are not that many lessons uh, that are similar. Uh, to, to what happens in Europe. I, I'm sure the, we talked earlier on about high-speed rail, uh, and certainly one of the lessons from Europe, has, in, ter in terms of the French network, for example, has been that they have invested in high-speed rail where the volume of traffic is such that they need new railways. Uh, both the French and the Germans have very much gone down. We, we have a capacity issue here, so let's invest in a new railway to relieve that capacity. That then creates capacity on the old railway for more freight. And I think that's probably a good example. <clears throat> Do you see any examples um, in Scotland of developing um, more freight-only lines or reopening perhaps very short uh, um, rail lines? Obviously, we've got quite considerable um, uh, extra railway lines, in the, if I use the beaching example, where there was a line in the past that's been closed down. Um, Do you see any examples in the short term? For I think Alawa has some direct freight only, doesn't it, on the line? But perhaps you could give some examples to the committee about that. Um, I mean, obviously, the Alloa line, uh, Alloa and through to, uh, uh, to Kincardine and on to Long Annet was opened as a freight line. Um, that gives us uh, uh, largely serve Long Annet Power Station. Um, interesting question, where we go with, with the closure of Long Annet Power Station? There is some freight on that line through to uh, Fife. It, it gives you... a uh, a gauge cleared route into Fife for, for container traffic, which we haven't currently got because of the restrictions on the fourth bridge, or well, we didn't previously have because of the restrictions on the fourth bridge. Um, I think we are always open to op opportunities um, if, if the traffic volumes are there, but it, it is a bit chicken and egg, I accept that until you've got the um, line, you won't have the traffic, but it's finding locations where when you build the line, people the, the, the traffic will appear. And I think, again, we've talked about that. I don't know if you've got any specific examples around the Yeah, I mean, we have, 
have reopened lanes in the past, but it's mainly been from cold traffic, um, where there is the bulk to, dry, to actually justify having a train. Um, I haven't got any examples of the recent f past or in the near future that we're thinking about opening lanes. Mm. So these are, that's a, perhaps something the committee can do a little bit more work on in terms of looking at European examples. Um, but thanks very much for uh, the, the questions and, and the answers that you've given. Thank you, Kimpin. Thank you. Do members have any final questions? And look, is there anything that you would like to say by way of closing? I don't think so. I think we've covered um, most of the issues we, w we wanted to do. Obviously, we welcome the significant investment that the, the government have made, particularly through the rail and freight investment fund. Uh, we're using that uh, over the current control period uh, as efficiently as possible to, to deliver these improvements we've talked about. Um, and we, we look forward to uh, a similar investment going forward uh, along the lines we've been discussing. OK, thank you very much. Um, in that case, it remains for me just to thank you for your evidence this morning, which is greatly appreciated uh, as we take forward this inquiry. And that concludes today's committee business. I now close this meeting. <laughs>